I'd like to introduce to the students and teachers now, Rachel Hawks Cameron, who's an abstract artist. She is self-employed. Um, and if you haven't guessed, she is partners with Jason Burns. So welcome, Rachel. Um, we're so happy to have you. Thanks for having me. Um, to start, so you are actually the first um, artist, uh, fine art artist that we've had uh, in as far as I'm aware, in the career mentor lineup. So can you tell the students a little bit about your art? Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm an abstract artist. Um, my work is mostly large scale canvases and I do acrylic paint on canvas. Um, I just put one behind me so you can kind of get a feel for it. Um, so I do a lot of big commissions uh, for clients. And then I also do smaller work on paper that I sell um, at sort of a lower price point, I guess. And that's what I sell through my website. And then people can also contact me and we could do a commission, which is a larger piece on Canvas. Yeah, can you explain to the students what commission means and how, that, how does that happen? And also, can you mention your website? And we'll put that in the chat so that people can look at your work as well. Yeah, sure. My website is just my name, Rachel Hawks Cameron. Dot com. Uh, Hawks is like H-A-W-K-E-S. Um, a commission, yeah, I didn't really know what this was before either, but a commission in my, in my experience with the clients I work with, it's often with people who have never, they have art in their house, but they've never reached out to an artist that they are really drawn to and kind of worked with them to create a piece almost together. So often when people reach out to me, my clients um, have a new home and um, are kind of ready to curate it, I guess you could say. And so mm -hmm. they'll, they are drawn to my work often because it's very colorful, very energetic and kind of quite positive is sort of the feedback I've been getting from people. It kind of invigorates them. And so often they'll sort of, they'll, they'll let me know which pieces in the past have spoken to them. And they're often their pieces that have been sold. And then they'll show me a picture of their space and say, I really want something that's like this. And I want it to be these kinds of colors. And I really want to evoke this. And so we'll kind of work together. And, um, and in, in terms of like a financial understanding of that, often that'll mean it's, a uh, high, like much higher price point than selling a piece on paper. Mm -hmm. So it'll be, my minimum is like $1,100 and it would be a big piece and they would do 50% of that cost up front. I would work on the piece. I would sort of communicate with them while I'm painting. And then once it's delivered, they would pay the other side of that. So that's my favorite way to paint because you really feel like you have a relationship with someone mm -hmm. and there's every step of it. And it's so gratifying to see it in their space later on. That, that's a fantastic explanation. That makes it super clear. Um, how do you find the inspiration? So someone says, this is my space. This is what I want. Instead of, so I imagine as an artist, it has to come from somewhere inside your heart or your soul, um, instead of just being, okay, this color, this color, this space. Yeah. yeah I think it's a combination of, um, it really helps me like my pieces on paper will come from somewhere very personal because they're not for people. Mm -hmm. They're just my personal feelings and like the personal emotions that come out when I'm in my headspace to paint, which is often very early in the morning, listening to music or listening to a podcast and thinking about things that are really important to me. Not always happy, joyful things, but just, just really feeling like in a meditative space and painting. And then it's always really interesting when people are able to pull, pull out those pieces and say, this really spoke to me. Because mm -hmm. then I'm able to take that energy and the spirit of whatever that piece was and work it into their piece and sort mm -hmm. of work that movement in. And often some of the stuff that comes out of my, um, my works on paper, which are those ones that are just sort of done in a solitary way, not for any client specifically, are things that I didn't plan on painting. They almost sort of just like come to be as I'm painting them. And sometimes that can like show me my own emotions that I'm going through. It's sort of mm -hmm. very unspoken and subconscious, I suppose. It's 
lovely. Um, did you always know you had a talent? Like, did you know from a young age you were going to be an artist? And were your, I'm, I always wonder, were your parents artistic? Were you supported in that way? Yeah, I mean, my parents were both journalists, actually. So I'm from Toronto. I actually was sort of writing this stuff down in preparation. And I realized I've relocated, like, actually relocated and moved between Toronto and the East Coast seven times. <laughs> I was a really creative kid. My, my parents really supported me because no one else in my family drew or painted or did artsy stuff. And so they did sort of encourage that side of me. Um, we moved to Halifax because my dad got a job and then back to Toronto. I went to three different high schools. Like I just have a very like eclectic background. Mm -hmm. And I know I really didn't ever think I would be an artist if I'm being totally honest. I loved art, but what I actually studied, I have an undergrad in environmental design from Dow, which is their architecture program. Mm -hmm. And I have a master's degree from... NASCAD, which is obviously the art school in Halifax. Um, and so my background is really in architecture, but it's also in journalism and writing about architecture. And so, I mean, I, I wrote down like how my path went, but it's just so like nonlinear that I don't know if it's too confusing. No, I, I, if you could share that, I think that's very interesting because we have touched on that with almost all of the mentors that no one's path has been linear and that you're, you end up in in routes and paths that you were never, uh, that never crossed your mind and how you got there could be completely haphazard. Um, and then boom, here you are in something completely new. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not the end. It's not like, I don't think this is the end of my path. It's just like, which is sort of how I thought when I was near in the end of high school, it's like, okay, what am I going to be for the rest of my life? And it's right. not, that. and I wish I'd known that because <laughs> it's such a relief. Um, yeah, so, okay, then I'll give you a little brief rundown. I have some notes. So, yeah, I, I grew up in Toronto, moved to Halifax, and then moved back to Toronto, and I went to a performing arts high school, which sort of, like, broke me out of a very, like, shy... I was a very shy kid, and so it kind of broke me out of that and exposed me to the art world. Um, and then once I went to a few other high schools, because I just couldn't stay in one place... Um, I actually decided it was more important to me where I went to university than what I was studying. Mm -hmm. So I went to Halifax, I went to Dow, and I studied everything. I studied, started in geology, environmental sciences, then I went to gender studies, which I loved. And eventually I happened upon the architecture program there, which actually you had to have two years of an undergrad in something else to get into the program. So it was sort of advantageous that I had taking a little time to kind of explore around. Uh -huh. And the architecture program was just really a perfect fit for me. Um, I just lost my dad. And so I sort of was like looking for a path. I think I was feeling a bit lost and architecture offered, you know, there's something so creative. It was so disciplined, the program. It was really demanding, which I kind of was craving at that moment and ready mm -hmm. for um, it was rooted in history, it was technical, and it was just like an incredible, it's like the, someone called it the, the umbrella of design because it sort of touches everything. We were doing Conte drawings on the South Shore and then we were building models in the studio. And uh, I just really, I really loved the program. But I will say like, I barely got into that program. I was on the wait list and I kind of just squeezed in the last moment. And then at the end of the undergrad, I didn't get into the master's program. And I, I at the time, I was devastated because it was such a close knit group of friends that had gone to the program. And I was sort of embarrassed. And so instead of kind of like owning that, because it really was the right decision, I wasn't really technically strong enough to become a practicing architect, which is what the master's degree is for. I really loved the representational side and just the sort of industry as a whole. Um, so then I just kind of took it upon myself to experience everything. So I moved to New York City and then I moved to El Salvador and then I and then I worked in an interior design firm until they figured out that I didn't really know what I was doing. <laughs> and finally, I made my way to um, an international uh, architecture publication called Azure, which was really like, finally, I found my love for architecture, my love for writing, my love for design. 
And that was like such a grounding moment for me. And that's when I finally decided I wanted to go back to school. And so that's when I got my master's degree. And what was your master's in at NASCAD? It was in design. So it's a master's mm -hmm. of design. It's a thesis led program. Um, so it's just a year long, but it's an intensive year and you come out of it with a thesis. And so my thesis was about how the design of playgrounds affects childhood development. So that was me using my architecture background, using sort of like a research and observational background that I'd gained from my undergrad. And, um, and it was really cool. I like came out of that and had this thing I could show that, that was um, included graphic design, included infographics, and also sort of ignited a love for illustration for me which was slowly I was moving towards my painting world, which I didn't know at the time, but. That is fascinating. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, are you able to show any of your art now? Do you have anything that you can show? I'm not sure if that's accessible. Um, I don't, like I'm not, no, I can't right now. Okay, that's okay. We'll direct them to the website. It's a little glitchy. So yeah, the website's probably best. Yeah, no, that's great. This is absolutely lovely. Um, I want to invite uh, students uh, to ask some questions to you. And I, I think sometimes we wonder, how does an artist survive? You always hear like the starving artist. And so how lucrative is it for you to work on commission and um, your other art sales? Yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Like, I think that's sort of one of the things that kept me from even exploring the idea of living a life as an artist just because it's not usually known as something that is very fruitful. Um, I really util utilize Instagram a lot. Like that's what actually got me from just painting to selling my work. Mm -hmm. um, the way that I fell into painting, um, it's sort of personal, but um, I feel like it's quite relevant because as I was thinking about it, there's all these things that happen in your life and maybe they've already happened to some of the students or they're going to happen, but there's these moments that sort of change everything. It could be good or bad. And for me that I lost my little brother. And so that for me was like, really, I just, my whole um, wiring changed and painting was what enabled me to sort of move through that. And so I started posting my paintings on Instagram, showing my work on Instagram and, and really kind of like sharing my grief and working through that. And people started wanting to buy them. And so um, I did, I put them on Etsy, which is like a really easy platform to sort of sell stuff and show stuff off. And then from there, I built an, a Shopify website, which was quite easy to use and easy to set up. And then I started getting the commission inquiries. And so um, there, oops. It's okay, keep going, yeah. Can you guys still see me? Yeah, you're good. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, there is a lot day to day. I'm not just in my studio painting from morning till night. It's responding to media inquiries. It's fulfilling orders of, of print. I sell my prints as well. So fulfilling those orders, fulfilling original artwork orders, feel, fulfilling media orders or media requests. Um, and so I've gotten it to a point where it is sustainable for me and I'm able to turn down commission inquiries because I have too many at the time um, but to be perfectly honest in the same vein of wanting to uh, considering myself sort of a creative not just a painter I do still work part-time in the architecture uh, in the architecture world I still do writing and editing and work on proposals and stuff and that's not necessarily for the for the pay, although that's a reality that definitely we've been facing with COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but just to kind of keep my, to keep those parts of my brain ignited. And I really benefit from writing and reading and learning about architecture. It informs everything I do. That's so amazing. That and, yeah. yeah, no, thanks for sharing all that, Rachel. That's beautiful. Um, we do have a question. How long does it take you to complete a small piece as compared to a larger commission? Yeah, that's a great question. Small pieces, like maybe an hour or two. A lot of my work is really water-based. And so I do a lot of like big washes of water that I kind of have to let them sit and dry naturally. And so with a smaller piece on paper, obviously that 
can be quite quick. I can come and go on like four different pieces at a time and sort of just like manage that time building up layers. On a larger piece, there's a few steps to it. Like I do, a lot, I do small studies and I do small pieces on canvas and I, okay, yeah. So start to finish with a large canvas, it would be, I'd say 20 hours. Um, I paint on raw canvas and then it's stretched. And then um, my husband does the frames, Jason does the frame building. Um, so about 20 hours or more sometimes. And then of course there's the matter of shipping things and the matter of prepping them and everything. So definitely a commission takes quite a long time. Oh, I can imagine. Um, we have, I'm gonna give you one more question and then we'll let you go. The last question is, how do you plan financially when your income is based on customer preference? Is your art a lucrative career financially? And you did speak to that, but I guess the planning piece. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I do, yeah, I, when I'm doing my commissions, I'm at a point now where I have enough commission inquiries that I can kind of um, stagger them. And so if I know there's going to be a large income from the commission, I can kind of stagger that out. And then I think that's why I stay so active on Instagram is because that's sort of like a quick sale. It's a quick way to... to uh, make a little bit of money, I guess, that sounds kind of crude, but um, those are more accessible pieces for people who are not able to do a big $5,000 commission. If, if I keep painting um, quite often, which I do, I'm quite prolific, I guess, in terms of like pumping stuff out all the time, then that's sort of like an easy way to create income constantly and it buys me time for um, the larger commissions. Thank you for that. That's great. Rachel, it has been absolutely lovely to meet you today. Thank you for sharing and um, we'll definitely look at your art. I highly recommend you have gorgeous pieces um, and I'm sure that the students have found you just delightful and um, very inspiring. Uh, and if there are more questions, I will certainly send them your way. Yeah, please reach out anytime. I'd love to chat more if anyone's Thank interested. you. Okay, take care and happy new year. You too. <laughs> Bye.